So welcome. Uh, my name is Michael Kennedy, and I welcome you to this lecture at Brown University. But I begin with this acknowledgment. Brown University is located in Providence, Rhode Island, on lands that are within the ancestral homelands of the Narragansett Indian tribe. The Narragansett Indian tribe, whose ancestors stewarded these lands with great care, continues as a sovereign nation today. We commit, as Brown University, to working together to honor our past and build our future with truth. That theme will come back today. Today we welcome Kumo Ramsey Talm to Brown University again. But I do so only as the interim director of the Contemplative Studies Initiative and Concentration. It would be far more appropriate and certainly consistent with the protocols Kumo Ramsey Talm normally follows when he visits other places to have an elder from the Narragansett here to welcome him to Providence and to this gathering. And while Kumu Ramsey arrived here on Monday and was previously here nine years ago, he is not the only guest here. Most of us are visitors to this Narragansett home. I am grateful, however, that the executive director of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Initiative, Ray Gould, herself a member of the Nipmuc tribe of Massachusetts, is here and has herself and with her Brown University organization helps us support Kumu Ramsey's visit with us. So thank you very much, Ray. Thank you. Also, with the support of the Watson Institute, Alexander, my friend, is here manning the video scene. Uh, the Washington Institute for International and Public Affairs, and the Institute at Brown for <coughs> Environment and Society. Those three organizations provided the support for this event, but it was the Contemplative and Studies Initiative and Concentration that gives us the motivation for hosting Kumu Ramsey here today. Kumu Ramsey has all the plaudits you could imagine from any LinkedIn entry. Among the incredible number of responsibilities he has held and the contributions he has made, I'd like to only note here that he is the director of the Pacific Islands Leadership Institute at Hawaii Pacific University and is also the cultural sustainability planner at PBR Hawaii and Associates. But the things which have drawn me to him in the past are unlikely to be found in most such professional profiles. Kumu Ramsey has been called a young ancient, and he has been mentored and trained by respected Kapuna. He works in and is an instructor of several Native Hawaiian traditions, including Ho'oponopono, He's been helping me with that. I've been <laughs> doing it badly. Lomihaha and Kaihewalu Lua. I came to know Kumu Ramsey on September 1st, 2012, 10 years ago, because I wished to extend my work in the sociology of martial arts. But I have learned so much beyond that initial quest and now see that quest as only a very small part of the things I need to learn and even of the things I have already learned from Kumu Ramsey. And I'm so grateful that I'm not the only one now at Brown University who has learned so much. There are many familiar faces here whom I have seen not just in the past but also at previous events this week. The thing that I especially appreciate about Kumu Ramsey is that I keep on discovering new aspects of him that I hadn't known previously. One of the things that I've come to know over the last few years is his deep involvement in not only extending and deepening indigenous Hawaiian traditions, but also making alliances and mobilizations with other indigenous communities across the world, and especially across the Pacific. He's told me about several things already, and I think we'll probably talk about many of them today, so I don't want to give anything away. 
except to say that there is a title for his presentation today. Indigenous alliances and mobilizations moving policies and practices seeking justice and sustainability across the Pacific. If that sounds like Kennedy speak, you're right. After listening to Kumu Ramsey in anticipation of this visit, I was trying to synthesize in my own way all of the things he might address in today's presentation. But I know that that's not only terrible grammar, but it's also terribly inadequate to all the things we'll learn today. So I'd like to just conclude by saying mahalo above all to Kumu Ramsey for being with us this week, but also to you for joining us for this very special occasion. So without any further ado, please help me welcome Kumu Ramsey Town to talk today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Listening to that, I could almost be exhausted. You know, that's a lot of stuff. I, I kind of remember, did I really do all that? Did I, is that really neat? But thank you for that, those kind comments, Michael. Uh, it's nice to be back. It's good to see uh, friendly, fr friendly faces, friendly faces. That just to show them what my day's been like. Um, first of all, aloha. Thank you very much. Um, the second word is mahalo. Michael just used it, and in Hawaii, mahalo tends to be used to say thank you. It's an expression of gratitude. But in the deeper uh, principles of our place and our language, ma is the concept of towards and internal. It's inside. The concept of ha is life-giving breath, which can only come from spirit, which is spirit. Uh, the third conjunction or word is allo, to be joined, uh, to be together, face to face, in one another's face, mahalo. And so when you're saying mahalo, you're really saying we are now connected. What you have shared with me, I am now receiving in the deepest sense of gratitude and connecting it. We are now connected, yeah. as family would be connected. And it is a commitment to that relationship. Mahalo is an expression of a relationship. It is a commitment as is aloha, which I'm going to speak about here shortly, it is a commitment to say that I will not damage the air and the space that you're in because that's my space as well. And that this commitment of receiving and giving, the foundation of aloha, this reciprocity, is what allows us to share this space in this place, face to face. So that is what mahalo is all about. So I mahalo you for being here and sharing your space in this place with us. Now, if you can't make that commitment, then just say thanks. <laughs> no commitment and thanks. It's just an acknowledgement. But to our cousins that are from this place, mahalo for allowing us to be here. And uh, as Michael was suggesting, our protocol is always to honor them. And more importantly, while there are several of them in the room, these empty chairs, it's also honoring the empty chair, the chair that's never really empty. It's filled by our ancestors. It's our descendants yet to come, those who couldn't make it today, the birds, the wolves, the whales, all of the things that we advocate for and our communities, for those of us that are advocating for communities and nonprofit work, whatever that might be. And I start with that by saying, before we begin, before we commence with any activity, supposedly on their behalf, that we always check in with them first. We always consider the empty chair and not just speak for them any more than if they were sitting in the room with us right now, but to give them knowledge and respect, their needs, their wants, their desires, their pains, their happiness, etc to make sure they're in the room. So I offer that as a gift, as something to consider, that when you hold these meetings for others, honor the empty chair. Yeah. Make that a part of the table um, as we do our ancestors and those before. So please, if you wouldn't mind just allowing me to talk to them for a moment. From the Pacific, 
the islands of Hawaii to Turtle Island. Yeah. <laughs> He ma lamba pono kamanao, ke ola, ke kino, i kamanawa apaulo a. Aloha e, aloha e, aloha e. So in those words, uh, the first part of that, it speaks of relationships. The most important relationship was within self, mind, body, and spirit. Your spirit, your mind, your body. It speaks of connections, that we're all connected. Whether it's nine years, 90 years, nine million years, we're all connected. Not just while we're here, but when we leave. Because we've breathed the same air together. We've shared this space. You walk out with the air that I breathe, I walk out with the air you breathe. We're connected. And if anything, COVID demonstrated that. <laughs> if you don't believe me. Right? We're all connected. The second part of it actually talks about tumalama. It is to care for. To care for the unification of that alignment. And really, it's about alignments. And if anything in the work that I do, it's about aligning. How do we find an alignment? In this case, within myself, with divine, with the creative energies around me, and even those in the space that in front of me, the mirror to who I am. And so this malama is to care for that, that unification through all time, not just while we're here. And in doing that, we honor the past as well as the future we do so from the moment. As a student of history, I spent a lot of time thinking about that, but also anticipating the future. But none of that means anything until we can navigate the present. And so the practices of Lua, which we'll talk about a little bit, and Ho'oponopono, only for framing purposes, these two systems that are part of the same coin are really about how to address those tensions, those opportunities dealing with the memories of the past that serve as obstacles to the future, but dealing with those things that present themselves in a way that allow us to be present. And so these two systems of uh, mediation, remediation, is really about being present. And if there's anything that I've learned, or at least have experienced through these practices, as well as through uh, these experiences that elders have shared with me, is that being present and standing in line is important, the concept of alignment. When we're lost and we don't know where to be, the concept of just standing in line gives you purpose. What do I mean by that? When we step out of line or we are out of line in our lives, our ancestors have nothing to look forward to. Everything that they've done, everything they did, good, bad, or indifferent, ends. There's nothing. They're gone. What's the purpose then for our ancestors? My descendants took back and they can't find the end. Where do they start? What purpose? How do I know progress? What does that look like? And so if we ourselves have no other purpose for this day, step up and stand in line. It gives them purpose gives them reason. And now we've connected. In the indigenous mindset, there's often, we've heard this before, the seven generations. Have you heard that before? Operating from the seventh generation. The tendency, however, is to look at the seventh generation as the first and the seventh. It's a very long time. Show of hands, anyone here know your great-grandmother? Met them, knew them? That's a gift. Right? Any of you great-grandchildren know your great-grandmother? Who are the great-grandchildren here? You're the great-grandchildren. Do you know your great-grandchildren? Any of you? No. See, I have a child, a grandchild coming up who will be my mother's first great-grandchild. I knew my great-grandmother. 
like some of you do. That's the fourth generation. Why is that important? Because by identifying myself in the fourth generation, I become accountable to my great-grandmother. I become accountable to my great-granddaughter. You see that? Otherwise, it's just too far away. And many of us will make the excuse, ah, they'll take care of this. But see, by accepting that particular posture, that position, it puts me in a different role, one of being accountable. In a world that is driven ostensibly by accounting, right? We live in a world of accounting, where the information I'm sharing with you comes from a world of accountability. And that metric, that shift, I think, is a big part of what we're going to be talking about tonight, how the relationships. And one of the things I've, I, I've also had the pleasure of doing was being a co-founder of a program at Chaminade University. It's called the Island Business Concentration, MBA. So it's not business. Business isn't the problem. What we're looking at was the mindset, the values, the metrics of success, and how do we begin to shift them to one that is much more in alignment with our places and our relationships. That being the current business models that we are accustomed to tend to start out with exit strategies. And the communities that you're in have no intention of exiting. They don't plan to leave. And so the metric of success there tends to shift to a, a model that says how much growth, how much, whereas the accountability model of our communities is really operating off of how well. A qualitative versus a quantitative. I don't want to say versus. That sets up a competition. But rather, right? There tends to be a focus on accountability and how well, rather than accounting and how much, how many. A good example, and we'll get to the questions. A good example is that when I would go to my grandmother's house, and somebody may relate to this, Whenever I walk into my grandmother's house, before I hit the gate, I could hear this voice from in the back of the house. It was a call that was just unmistakable. Ooh, ooh, my, 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 come inside, come inside. It's my girl. It's like, uh-oh, she knows I'm here. I'm here. How did she know? Somebody down the road told her, your grandson's coming. But I hear, hooey, my, 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 come, 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 come. Recognition. Wow, that's cool. I'm being invited in. Walk in the house. She never asked, so, how was your day? How many people did you talk to? How much did you make? None, none of those things. Guess what her first question was? Ultimately, every single time I walked into her house. Anyone? What do you think? Yeah, there, that's part of that. But there's a different way of asking that question. That's it. There you go. See, as I'm saying, there is some deep connection here, right? So she, her question was, you hungry? You ate, right? How about some? And you're not going to say no. She said, sit, sit, sit. And she puts food on the table. Two hours later, she's still putting food on the table. <laughs> oh, no. Piha, piha. I'm full. Thank you, Grandma. That's enough, enough, enough. You sure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Piha, piha. I'm full. You sure? You sure? She goes, yeah, yeah. She goes, okay. Then take some home. <laughs> I share that with you because some of you can relate to that. Whether it's your grandmother, your auntie, your mother, somebody. But that was a relational thing. And more importantly, there's a commitment. That, that could have been her last plate of food, and it still would have been on the table. Because her commitment at that point, her metric of success was that, one, if you're in my home, you will be fed. And more importantly, that when you leave, you don't leave empty-handed. 
this was not the last place that you're going to get nutrition. You're going to get to your next destination. No one's going to say that you didn't eat in this house. Right? She may go hungry in the next two days, but that's my responsibility now. Right? Because I knew that that was the last plate of food. So I should have come with food anyway. You see that? That's aloha. It's knowing that by custom, she was going to give me food. By custom. Therefore, you don't go empty-handed to this place because you know food is hard to come by and she's going to give it to you. Therefore, you come and you maintain the balance. That's a relationship. But more importantly, you never bring something she's not going to eat. So if you go to a party and you bring something to, to feed people and they give it to you when you leave, they don't eat it. It's not for them. You brought it for you. And more importantly, if you bring something that is not healthy for them because they have an ailment, a disease, or a distaste for it, what you've demonstrated is you really don't know who your, your host was. Right? That's relational. Now, I'm starting our conversation in the home, in the family. But I'd like to suggest we're all family. We all live in an island called Earth. Therefore, we're all indigenous to Earth. We all have a place. Some of us have forgotten our indigeneity as well as our indigenuity. But we're all indigenous in some place. And so that when I'm visiting someone else, I have to honor those same traditions. They're going to feed me. I need to feed them. Foundational is a law, reciprocity. But as we have moved to a society and a way of being which is more me than we, we have now found, thanks maybe even to COVID, that the heart does grow fonder when we've gone yonder, right? That we do need one another, that we do want to be in the company of others, that we do want to share, or there is much more sharing that we're aspiring to. Which once again, in the world of business and economics, we measure the amount of shares you own, not how much sharing you do. And in our communities, it's how much you sh you're sharing that really earns you the credit, not how many shares you own. Yeah. And so as the world begins to globalize and we begin to separate and we become actually more like one another than maintaining our own diversity, the work that we're talking about is how do you begin to maintain these alliances and to find out that uh, we are really much more similar than we are different. Similar but not same, but I think we all have the same aspirations. And for someone that is living in a place that continues to uh, aspire to return to its own identity, to a posture and a position where we're not recognized as being someone else's stepchild, that's an important concept to begin to grasp that we are who we are, not because of what someone else defines us to be, that self-identification, which is very hard to do when you don't know your place, you don't know your food, you don't know your relationships. And these new alignments are helping us to remember. Your difference is what makes me different. But if I see the same thing, then we need something's wrong. And we're, we're experiencing now is this homogenizing of, the, of our places so that I can go to one place or another, have the same food I had in the last place. I can have the same experience, and after a while, we've lost the, the magic of that diversity. If there is ever a place that is diverse in one family, it's Polynesia. If there's ever one place that is diverse, is the Pacific. You know, you can get on a plane on one island and fly the same distance you would fly across the country here in the United States and still land in Polynesia. It's the same family. It's a different island group, same family, Polynesian, which is quite interesting, you know. And today in the so-called regenerative economic world, we use these terms like uh, decentralized as if that's the preferred condition. We need to decentralize this and decentralize that. Well, guess what? The Pacific is decentralized. 
It's been decentralized for generations. And yet, we have a common language, a common cultural concept, a com common connection. What does that? What did that? How do, we, how do we get there? And maybe we've forgotten. So the work that we're doing now in terms of trying to rebuild these alliances isn't just for the family in the Pacific, those who share those waters, but to a global family that might be able to benefit from remembering what it is to live on an island. I would support the premise that Earth is more like an island than it is a continent. And in the sustainability delivery systems of today, landlocked communities in the middle of the continent are experiencing what we in the middle of the ocean are experiencing. The challenges of supply systems, right? Your food coming from someplace else, energy from coming some, from someplace else, to the fact that just because you're in the middle of a cornfield doesn't make you part of the continent. The truck has to come, the plane has to come, everything's to come. You are an island, just happen to be on the continent. So in more and more cases, people are actually being impacted in the same way islands and the oceans are, which changes the framework. So I'm going to give you a framework called Blue Continent. So back in 2008, we started referring to the Pacific and Oceania as the Blue Continent because it was a, a frame shift that allowed for an economy of scale. We weren't tiny islands, but we were the mountaintops of a large continent. Hawaii, Samoa. These are the mountaintops of the ridges that define the blue continent. Now, if I take that analogy farther, when I first came to the continent, I was taught, oh, if you want to learn anything, you go to the sages on the top of the mountains. Climb the mountain and talk to the sages. Well, if that's the case, maybe the sages of the 21st century are on the mountains of the Pacific. And oddly enough, the new blue economy and all the things we're talking about now keep pointing to the Pacific, whether it's going to be for ocean mining or other things. China's there. All of the things that are happening, it's happening in the Pacific. The Pacific is the largest single body on the planet. All other continents can fit in it. It moves the weather. It changes the climate. It connects us. It doesn't disconnect us. People would look to the water as a barrier or something that separates. For us, that was the highway. It connected me. And for those that don't believe that, go back to the Indonesian and the Japanese Fukushima earthquake. The people in California and Portland were finding boats, chairs, and cups that were in Japan just a few days before. We're all connected. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean we're not connected. So the metaphor for us in Hawaii is that while the islands are separate, on the surface we may be separate, but in the deep, we're all connected. So with that introduction, that premise, and acknowledging that we're all family, how do we rebuild our familial and our heritage in the relationship called an earth culture? Right? At the same time, we're looking at the tensions between the governing systems that want us to make us different, that want to control the resources, that define who we are better than them, them and us, et cetera, et cetera. We call it common ground. But what we've done is we've drawn lines on the ground and said, that's their ground, that's my ground, that's her ground, that's his ground. It's anything but common. If there's anything that the pandemic demonstrated was, that what's common is the air. and the water. And for those of us living in this place called Hawaii, that's not news to us. The very name of our place, every place say the word ha. In Hawaiian, ha means life-giving breath, the spiritual breath, the essence, the first thing you get when you come to the planet, the last thing you give back when you leave. And in between the first and last breath, you never own it. You share it with others. The air between us, the space, the atmosphere, that's the ha. Have you ever heard the statement, let's clear the air between us? It's really critical. It's a critical covenant. So ha, that is the first thing, the life-giving breath. Everyone say vai. Vai or wai. Vai is fresh water, the life-giving water. 
But there's two kinds. There's vai and there's kai. Vai is the fresh water that comes from the heavens, the clouds. It lands on the land, up in the mountains. It washes through and goes to the ocean, picking up all of the debris, all the nutrients. It goes to the ocean and now becomes kai. From vai to kai. It's been charged by everything in the land and becomes the sea. Vai, the feminine, kai, the masculine, the balance. And like the island and the land, we take in vai in the mountains. It cleans our system out and becomes kai, the salt water. Explain that to the next guy. And so this is just in the very name itself. We're reminded about our relationship. We are the land. We are the aina. Like the island, the wind, the clouds, the moisture runs to the land and it's excreted into the ocean. So we have these two fundamental elements of ha and vai. Last concept, everyone say e. E, it's the letter i, but its pronunciation is e. E is a spiritual creative energy that provided the ha and the vai, you and I. This is the E. This is the thing that's in all of us. This is why we're connected. When you're a punno, when you're aligned, mind, body, and spirit, you are now one with the E, one with the I, the large I am. Oh, wow, no, make a ha, ha, I am humbled by this. And so when you see someone in front of you and you're speaking to them, it's not me to Michael. It's I to I. Spirit to spirit. Creative energy. Creator to creator. When we can get to that point where it's not the personality, it's the spirit. This is aloha. If anything, there is the aspiration. There is the opportunity. If we acknowledge that connection, then why are we fighting? I'm told it's cheaper much more economical to feed our enemy than it is to fight him. So why aren't we? If it makes business sense, then why don't we? Because there's more money in the other. That has nothing to do with business sense. That's just plain greed. Right? So if we can get down to this, so the work we're doing in the Pacific Island Leadership Institute is really asking ourselves and creating a space where perhaps the values, principles, and practices of an island worldview might be able to actually impose or impact the worldview. They were all islanders floating in the sea of space. And so while I can go into the various aspects of the work that we're doing in the Pacific with the Pacific Island leaders and the Pacific Forum and APEC and a number of other things, uh, it's quite exciting, actually. But I'd like to suggest that if we step back and we look at time and mankind and what we've done, let's start in China and moving over to Mesopotamia and then into London and then to New York and then to Los Angeles. And now where? It's coming across the Pacific. Right? China has risen once again. The dragon has shown its colors. Right? But here's the nice part. In between the jump from the west coast of the United States, the continental US, to the Asian continent, there's a little island group called Hawaii. And maybe, just maybe, we have an opportunity to redirect some of that energy or influence it. Right? As these two large superpowers stare one another down. It's like the child looking up at mom and dad going, all right, calm down. We can take care of this because we're family. So with that in mind, thank you for having me. We're going to talk more, but I want to direct it to Michael or anyone else, actually, if there are any specific questions that you might have. Because when there are questions that I know, there's soil ready for the seed. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Kuma Ramsey. I'll uh, bring the microphone to any of you who would like to raise issues. I've got a million questions in my head, but that's because I've known Kumu Ramsey now for a decade. And every time I talk with him, I learn something new and at the same time deepen what I've learned. So the, the beauty of thinking about each story 
that Kabo Ramsey can tell you, and to think about the way in which it re refines and, and renews and redirects the ways in which we think, not just about what he's saying, but about the larger world that we're also thinking about. So this is the opportunity for y'all you know, to think about this. And don't give me the space to occupy it, OK? <laughs> And when you speak, just give me your name, right? So that we get to at least know the name and the face so that it's my eye to eye and not just my name to your name. Josh. Good to see you, Josh, again. Um, how do we remind people that they grew from the earth and that they weren't dropped as strangers on this planet? Mm. Well, I'm not sure we weren't dropped on this planet, but uh, presuming we weren't. Um, there's an old adage that says we teach people how to treat us. And I think it's less about telling and more about showing. Is that I find that when I have someone who's lived in an urban experience for pretty much all of their lives, and we actually take them and stick their feet in the mud, something happens. In the same way that you take your Bluetooth phone and pair it to your car, this is about a repairing. Once people get paired back to the earth, they remember. How long that memory will last is based on how we reinforce that memory through action, through activity, through opportunity. Because once they return to that urban setting where they're disconnected from that, then the habits come back the current conditions to survive. And there's nothing wrong with that. You have to survive in that environment. But I find that once people's hands and their feet, their heads get into the environment again and they spend quality time there, something happens. Now, not all people want to stay there, but they now know that there's a difference. There's a connection. But I think you have to show them. We have to give them the experience. Just telling them isn't enough. I was just sharing this the other day, a comment made in a, in a workshop I was in recently was, was quite profound. And basically, the gentleman said, you know, if it's not a lived experience, it's just a claim. And so I can claim all, everything I want based on my experiences, but until you step in the mud, it's just a claim. So I don't know that we can tell them anything. Your question of showing is much more conducive to that. But if that's the case, we have to create safe ways of letting them experience that. So in Hawaii, we call that huaka'i, an excursion, an experience. And through the huaka'i, hua means to rise up. Ka'i is that first step through, right? To rise up and step out. And through these excursions of huaka'i, getting deep into it, doing these protocols, communing in real meaningful ways, the oli that I did early is, is another way of communing because the elements of expression that I use in the vibration tells it right, that I'm here and it can respond. It can spit me out or it can receive me. It's that communing, it's that vibration, it's that repairing. So this is a, a big repair job, right? but not from the standpoint of fixing anything, but of healing something. So that's it. I think part of it is getting people to touch the soul. So the rootedness. Um, and I think that's a very purposeful term. Where are you rooted? You know? And so Auntie Plahi would say, from root to fruit. Now, unfortunately, much of the fruit today falls so far from the tree, it actually vilifies the root. It no longer acknowledges where it comes from. You know? So I like to tell my students, the, the fruit that falls close to the tree but not under its shade shall feed many. Right? We know that if you fall under the shade of the tree, you don't grow much. Hard to grow in the shade of a tree. But you just fall outside and get enough nutrients and light. You can grow too. And you have someone to teach you. But we have those that have fallen so far that they have no guidance, they have no connection, 
they no longer recognize their ancestors. Right? So we've got to get them in the mud. Yes? There's two here. Um, Ray Gould. Um, so you've brought up some really interesting points or terms, phrases, ways of thinking, ways of being, and ways of knowing. Mm -hmm. um, just listening to your, to your response and these words that you're using. And it would be so nice to see those institutionalized yes. at a place like this, right? But not with Native Studies, mm -hmm. right? So with other, with other places, and we talked earlier about, um, I think the term I used was tentacles, mm -hmm. right? So, so there's a nodule here, and there's Native American and Indigenous Studies, and we only have so much energy, we only have so much capacity, we can only do so much. Right. So we're planting Indigenous people all across the university. Most of you don't even know them. They're staff and not not teaching faculty yet, but units like yours yours is contemplative studies, right? There's no longer term. Is it just contemplative studies? Contemplative studies. Like contemplative studies initiative. initiative. So a, a lot like what we're doing, the <coughs> initiative, and then and then a developing concentration. So other units mm -hmm. maybe becoming the hub and the place to like gather and create a university-wide effort to invite this thinking and this talking ab among non-native people, right? So it's like Indigenous Peoples Day and the, the land acknowledgement, it's not our labor. It's not our time and our place to educate everyone else. It's, it's the labor of everyone else too. And, and, and you're helping this. You're, and so I just wanna guess, there's no question, I just wanna say thank you because you're making me think about the importance and that baseline way of how we think about our place in the world in our in our our relationships. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you for being here to educate all of these people. It's it's really wonderful to well, see. Well, thank it. you for having me. Thank you for welcoming. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's an important thing. Uh, we were talking about earlier words and the weight that we give to words, because in our current context, we use words to put on as labels. They become mechanical and yet they have deep meaning. And I like to suggest whether it's a big N or a little N, we're all native, right? The computer guys, well, it's native to this. It's native to that. It has nothing to do with indigeneity. They're indigenous to this computer. No, it's native. What's the native language? I like to suggest that there is a root culture and that base operating system called Earth, which we all come from, at some point in time, we are all operating off that root system. Okay? But at some point in time, we started introducing software upgrades that are no longer compatible with the base operating system. And every time we drop in a new package, we crash the system. And instead of going back to the base operating system, we keep tinkering with the software. So we get farther and farther away from the base operating system. When we say native, it doesn't mean indigenous. It means that you are from that place. We're all native to earth. We're all native. But the thing is, we have replaced the native practices, concepts, and thoughts because of the economic models of globalization, which begins to move things and transplants and drops stuff in the software, drop packaging. Oftentimes ignoring that there is a base operating system that this software should connect to. So part of it is acknowledging that what is native to this place? Who are the places, who are the people here that can help us navigate this, who know this? Because the worst thing we want to do is take the native practices of Hawaii and drop them into Providence. No more different than dropping Boston into Honolulu, which is precisely what happened. When I look at Honolulu, it's not a development that came from the place. That was transported, transplanted by someone else. And so we are really fixing someone else's problems, which have become ours. We don't understand that. That's not where we're from. The kupuna, the elders who are the healers, who happen to be my elders, that was their response. People would come to them, we understand you're a healer. You can help me. He says, no, you're not from here. What does that mean? I don't know your illness. That's not an illness from here. Where are you from? Go back there. Because your DNA is upset. Oh, I don't know where I'm from. Okay, then you have to move here. You have to live with me. You have to eat this food, drink this water, and then we can start aligning you. Why? Because you have to be aligned with this manna, this energy. I cannot fix your manna. That's somebody else's manna. Go see that guy. 
there was a very clear relationship to one's responsibilities in place. And so as we invite others and we say, hey, come, we're here to help, but not at the risk of the very people themselves, the natives of those places, not knowing who they are. How do we repair and provide them with health? Because that's the weirdest thing in Hawaii. Now the marketing says, come to Hawaii, the one of the healthiest places in the planet, in the United States, blah, blah, blah. And the rooted culture is at the top of all the wrong lists. Native Hawaiians, highest in prison rate, high, Native Hawaiians, highest cancer rate, Native Hawaiians. And we're at the top of all, yet everyone come to Hawaii and live the lifestyle of the kings and the queens. That's the honesty that we're looking for, Michael. Right? That's the truth. What's the truth? And the multiple truths are, if I'm going to live my truth, somebody else is not going to live theirs. Equity. I think that's equity. Right? Those are the kind of things. But I think you're right. This is the opportunity to say, who, who is the persons or the persons that know this base operating system it can help us to reconnect to these things? And how do we then benefit together? Right? Um, because we all have to share this place right now, unless we have a plan to get rid of other people, right? which isn't an option for me. You had a question? So can, I, can I just do one yes, thing? Because I, I know the. I know there's a direct connection to something that I wanted to ask, mm -hmm. and maybe you'll. I know. I we know you. We know each other from class, so. But to build on Ray's point, I mean, we are speaking here in the Watson Institute for International Public Affairs, and yet we are using the indigenous frame to be talking, and this is the convergence that I would like for us to imagine, and, and because you have so much experience doing this, you know, we talk about diplomacy here mm -hmm. all the time, mm -hmm. but it's a diplomacy that's disconnected mm -hmm. from the operating system that you're talking about. So I wonder if you might share a story or two about the kinds of diplomacy in which you have been involved, you know, within Hawaii, Mm -hmm. across the Pacific, across indigenous <laughs> communities, or with those who don't get what this operating system is. Mm -hmm. and, and then we'll go to John. No, thank you for that, Michael. Um, actually, where I'm going after this is to Boulder to NCAR, National Center for Atmospheric Research. Ten years ago, we uh, helped to start a program called Rising Voices. And we talked about this earlier, but Rising Voices is a program where uh, traditional ecological knowledge, the native knowledge of the places, are now blending with contemporary science in dealing with climate change adaptation, right? And we're looking at what did, what do, and what did native communities do in their communities? How do they relate? And more importantly, what are their stories? For instance, uh, an elder from uh, the upper reaches of Alaska and Canada the poles. When they come down there, the first thing is, gosh, it's hot down here. But more importantly, they're now saying that they are the front lines of what's happening in the world. One set of elders said, for multiple generations, the sun used to come up over that mountain. Right now, the sun should be coming up over that mountain. It has always come up over that mountain on this day, this time, for multiple generations. That is not an opinion. That is a given fact. We hunt on that sun, we build on that sun, we plant, that sun is where. Today, it's rising over there. It's rising over there. You tell me, is something going wrong? Right, so in their mind, their indigenous native knowledge, their knowing of their place, that would be you going down the street to a stoplight and it's not there tomorrow and crash, cars crashing into one another because they all thought the sign was there. That's a sign. And they're saying this to the, the community, and we're going, well, that's really interesting. Wow. We'll take note of that. <laughs> it's like, you should be running around, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Because in their minds, it is. It's changed. It's that, that's a huge shift. So what did it have? Either the sun decided to wake up on the wrong side of the bed, or the earth has shifted so dramatically. I mean, that's a huge shift. It's not like, mm, it's like over there. So in the diplomacy of that, we have to slowly, 
this is a real thing. This is an experience we're dealing with. So at this particular session, when we were first invited, uh, it was going to be a conference like every other conference. And we asked the question, why is this an indigenous conference? Because we're here? What does that mean? So the three of us from Hawaii, when we came, we came in our regalia, that's one. And mind you, it's not costume, it's uniform, right? We came in regalia, and we said, okay, we're here. And the organizers came out and said, uh, the meeting's starting. No, not yet. Why not? Who's your elder? I know you guys are here, but you're not from here. Who's going to welcome us in or send us home? We need that guy. And they had never done anything like that. Well, here's the surprising part. The native elder of that community had never done that either. Oh, they just bring me in to say a prayer every now and then. I didn't know I could do this. I said, Dude, this is your place. Not only you can, you should. So he came in and I said, you need to send us home or welcome us in. And the, <laughs> the director's like, no, we need you guys here. Well, you better talk to him then, <laughs> right? And so we ended up doing protocol. And ever since then, that protocol is now how that conference starts. But more importantly, that action reframed the activity. You talk all the science you want. Do everything you normally do, but now it's in this new context. We are not a part of this. We are a part of this. We are a whole. And by shifting that frame, it changed the relationship. The context shifted. The context wasn't scientists trying to absorb cultural principles. We we're looking at what is the cultural experience of a living people in a world sharing one another. Your way of looking at it and our way of looking at it. It's the same world. And we had to get them to that point so that we could see eye to eye. Not like this. Right? I've been involved in integrative health. Integrative health to the allopathic medicine guys was, here's your health, here's our health. I said, wait a minute, how did that happen? Right? We were doing fine out here, but now we have to control it because there's a billing system. We need to certify you, but I have to teach you how to certify me. That's right. So I'm going to teach you how to certify me. Someone needs to be certified. I don't know. So at some point we had to just say, thank you, but no thank you. Sometimes the only way to win the game is not play. And that's a big part of it. And so the diplomacy is, and you don't have to be angry about it. And that's what was surprising to people. Because we didn't come in there, we want my land. Get out of town. Get. It wasn't that. It was just, thank you very much, but here's our protocol. We teach people how to treat us. And now the treatment has changed because that also showed them respect. And we did it respectfully. But it started with the law. It was embedded in a fundamental principle that says, tell you what, let's agree to disagree, but not be disagreeable. How's that? Right? I don't necessarily agree with you. Let's go have coffee. So you never break that down. Why? Because it honors the fact that your experience and my experience may be different. We might learn from that. But in the meantime, prove it. Show me while I'll show you. And in the process, we might come up with something really interesting. And it's part of it is putting that anger aside, redirecting the anger to something much more positive. It's not easy. I'm not here to say it's easy. But that's one of the mechanisms. You have to reach out. Because it's just energy. And it's usually uncontrolled energy, that anger, which to a certain degree is also fear. Right? And so you replace that fear and that anger with some degree of faith and confidence. Because I like to say that faith and fear are really the opposite sides of the same coin. You have to have enough faith that that dog's going to bite you to have a fear of dogs. You have to have enough faith that you're going to fall off this tree to be fearful of heights. It's just a matter of where you place your faith. I like to place my faith in humanity, at least that side of us that is aspiring to these other things. But it starts there. So our diplomacy needs, from my perspective, needs to start there. What's common within us, not what's different. Hi, my name is uh, John or JD. Hey, JD. Um, 
my question, I was really interested on how you were talking about the sort of collective community and sort of relation that is shared across Polynesia, mm-hmm. um, even though separated by these vast swaths. And, mm. and in my mind, it, it is still vast swaths of ocean. That Millions seem, of square miles. Yeah. and But there's still this sense of community and oneness. Mm-hmm. But then you have these other places where people blocks away, you, even in the same house, can't see a oneness, can't agree on anything. I mean, you have roommates here who are mm-hmm. at each other's neck. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you have any sort of advice on how we can sort of foster more oneness and build more empathy between people mm-hmm. while still recognizing and not sort of aiming to hit a homogene, homogen, homo, yeah, like a homogenous homogeneity yeah. state or a homogenous state, mm-hmm. um, still recognizing our differences, but mm-hmm. having immense empathy for uh, other people. Good question, JD. Thank you for that. Um, I like to turn to nature as our guide and teacher. That's where we come from. And so um, there's a principle in Hawaiian called lokahi. Everyone say lokahi. Yeah, lo, alo, joined to be in presence of kahi first, one, united. Lo kahi tends to talk about unity, but it also talks about solidarity. Solidarity means that we can agree without being disagreeable, but we have one common thing that we're going to do together. In the absence of the common enemy, we fight among ourselves. So until there's something common that we can all aspire to, then we're going to find something to fight about. It's kind of our nature. That's just how it is. And so what happens to be common to the Polynesian people is Pacific. We all get our food from it. If I have to rely on my food from coming from California, I'm going to fight over the food from California. I want it first. No, No, we're first because we're in line first. But when it's the Pacific, it's all in the Pacific. That's why we're family. Same food. Yeah, in our system, we call it Calabash Cousins. What we mean by that is that it didn't matter. We're not blood-related, but we all ate from the same bowl. That makes us family. When you eat from the same place, something happens. So if there's a way of doing that, we not only need to eat from the same place, eat from the same bowl. And unfortunately, the way the food system is operating right now, that's getting harder and harder because the food's coming from everywhere and nowhere. Where, who knows where the food comes from today? So this food security issue that we're dealing with right now, especially in the Pacific, when we've been taught to eat continental foods rather than foods from our places, is a huge problem. People have forgotten how to grow their own food or catch a food. And I'm not saying that blanket, because there are communities that have done really well to maintain that. But some of that is even being tried to be eked away by the continental mind, because they want to control that from a market standpoint. If you're not buying my bread and eating your breadfruit, you're not helping my market space. So we need to create a, a barrier from you eating your breadfruit. It has nothing to do with your nutrition. It has to do with the health of my business, not the health of your community. See, so we have to find some common metric of success. Your health is my health in what way? If my health is my business health, regardless of what your health is, it won't matter. Now, I'm taking the real hard line on this, but do you hear the energy in it? It's when, when we get to that point where it's, it's either me or them. What happened to the we here? And I think that's what happened. In the Pacific, there's still a we. Now, don't get me, right, get me wrong. There were times where we battled one another, right? Like every other human being, there were times that says, well, we don't have enough until we can. Let's go fight for it. But hopefully we've matured beyond that, and we got to a point, and it may be because the common thing that came to all of us was the enemy. We all got conquered by somebody. So our common condition is whether it's French Polynesia, whether it's uh, German Samoa, American Samoa, or whatever. At some point, somebody else came here and what's common to us all, oh, they did that to you too. Yeah, me too. Really? Ah, The enemy of my enemy is my friend. That might be the wrong reason to get together. But I'd like to suggest that's the commonality. 
all of these people were disenfranchised, disconnected from their families. And I would suggest that our cousins on Turtle Island experience the same thing. And that's why we're connected. In some cases, in other cases, we're directly family. In the west coast of, of California, I've been doing protocols and working with uh, tribes all the way from the northern part of California down. They're Hawaiian. Why? It's the Pacific. Hawaiians came in canoes. Funny thing, those canoes. You can go places. Right? And we ended up being in the West Coast, and our Hawaiians and Samoan boys are pretty big boys. You know? So who wouldn't have one of them on their team? And so we have a lot of native tribes along the Pacific who actually have Hawaiian origins. So to communicate with them, not too hard, because there's a shared heritage. So what's the global heritage? What's the Earth heritage? Do we have to wait for the asteroid or some other silver object to come and start threatening us to say, let's be friends. Can we fight that guy together? Why do we have to wait for the tragedy for us to come together? This is called precognitive. Can we get in front of this? Can we cogitate that reality rather than find ourselves into social interaction? Right? Policy tends to be driven by social interaction, not intellectual cogitation. Can we cogitate ourselves into this process? Because it's not only the right thing, but it's the smart thing. I guess that's the difference. We're not so smart. There's multiple intelligences. And what I think I'm sharing with you today is coming from multiple intelligences, not a singular one. And so it's risky to say there's a singular answer right? because it is a system. It's a system of systems. And all we're doing right now is tinkering in the systems. Right? So, sorry, long answer to a short question. I didn't know I had a soapbox with me today, sorry. <laughs> No, I was just going to say to follow up on that, as an anthropologist, I've often wondered since I started thinking about anthropology as a young person, like how much of that is human nature? Like mm -hmm. if we go back, you know, to like, you know, pre-humans even, like we see beings that died from like f skull fractures, you know, mm -hmm. from violence, from human violence. So I don't know, I just sit with this and I ask myself every day, like, you know, the, the nature versus nurture and like how much of, of this violent tendency that humans mm -hmm. have against mm -hmm. other humans mm -hmm. is just very innate in us, in our beings, because we are animals. We, we don't right. always want to admit it. Right. But anyway, just, f you know, just food yeah. for thought that I think about in my daily. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I kind of shared that with Michael yesterday. My observation is we're still pretty much the same animals we were. We're just a little more sophisticated, mm -hmm. right? I can kill you with a button instead of a spear. I'm still going to kill you, right? I'll use the highest form of technology called a computer, and I can plug in the GPS, the coordinates, right? But before I had to go. Now I go, you're still dead. But I did it more elegantly. We're still the same animal, right? Because that tendency, we weren't over the able to override the tendency. I like to think as humans, if that's the case, if that's really what makes us from a spiritual standpoint, can, I, can my spirituality override my physicality? Right? My sensuous, sensual being of having to nom, 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 whatever that is. Can I get over and say, well, you know, I know that's my nature, but I can really make a different choice here. How do I override that? I don't know what that mechanism is. Some say it's religion. Others say it's spirituality. Others say it's laws. Others say it's punishment. I don't know. What is that behavior? I like to think that it's a choice. You choose and you say, this is the integrity, the way I'm going to be. Because when I behave this way, these things happen. Not only am I not punished for it, but we're all rewarded for it. And I think all of this entire conversation is running on a spectrum of punishments and rewards. And unfortunately, one person's pain is another person's pleasure. That's difficult. Yeah. But you're right, we're all human. That's, that's the opportunity. Right? That's perhaps the frailty, the human condition. Can I just invite you to say something about a theme that has emerged across this week, but even preceding this week, mm -hmm. obviously for you, but even for us. 
And that is one of the things that I find really compelling about the way you communicate and the things you communicate is the significance of truth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with all of this polarization, we can imagine multiple truths very easily. But there is something appealing to the idea that there is a truth that can be mobilized mm -hmm. in order to satisfy, in order to address the needs that are now being overridden. So do you have any experiences or dilemmas or issues around the place of truth in actually mobilizing change? Um, there are several examples of that in Hawaii in particular around um, water, water conservation. Uh, right now, the United States Navy has admitted to um, constructing these tanks, jet fuel tanks. And they are located 100 feet above our aquifer. They've been there f since the war. They were secretly built there. I don't know how you could build, uh, but they did it. Right? There's a secret. So over the years, once it became known, people said, you know, you really be careful. You need to check those tanks. Well, it turns out they've been leaking. And they've been told they've been leaking. All right? So up until recently, they said, oh, no, it's, it's not a problem. And everybody in the military, and I'm not saying everybody, but there seemed to like them and us. Well, recently, what happened was that military dependents were living on the bases. They were relying on those water from the water aquifer. These are colonels, captains, right? Commanders on the base whose children were being burned by the water in, right, the gas in the water. Dogs falling over from being poisoned. Wives going to the hospital, right, passing out because of fumes. These are their own people, and the command structure wants to ignore it, wanted to ignore it, even in front of them. And so what it told those people was the truth was, we're expendable. How is that for a truth? We're sitting and saying, told you. I mean, what logical person is going to put trash over your head? No one's going to fall. Who would put gasoline over your head right, and put it up there? This is 100 feet over our water. What it says was they had no priority for the water. Now, we could get very cynical about it. It says, well, this was a plan all along, right? At some point in time, the gasoline is going to damage the aquifer, and now they're not going to live here, and it's ours for good because that's what's happening. The aquifer has now been damaged, right? And it's going to take some time to clean it. So fortunately, we have a, people with integrity are saying, look, we've got to stop this. We've got to cut this down. And the Navy was saying, well, we'll do everything possible to make sure that this gets fixed. So the governor says, well, great, then stop it, move the water, move the fuel out of there. No, we can't do that. We have a, a mission. We have to fly these jets because these jets are, U are US security, blah, 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 blah. So you mean you're going to let the very people you're supposed to protect die from poisoning because you need to fly a jet to protect them from what? Wh who are you protecting again? Right. So. The priority, all of a sudden, is like, wait a minute. And so now the people are saying, look, how are you going to do this? Now that water issue becomes really a big thing because now the United States Navy is involved. It's not the first time. It's happened in Utah. It's happened in Arizona. And I'll say, well, we'll clean it up. So why is it happening again? It's just a demonstration. Like, So we might be able to tolerate ignorance. I don't know. OK, you didn't know. But now you do. So now that you know, what are you going to do about it? Now you're just ignoring me. Right? I don't have to be Hawaiian. I don't have to be anything but human to say, that's not right. So this isn't a Hawaiian issue. This is a human condition. That is a crime against nature. That's a crime against the human condition. Forget the indigeneity stuff. That's just plain wrong. But because of a mission, and a budget. Well, it's going to take a long time for us to clean this up. So what are we supposed to do in the meantime? Right? You know how much it's going to cost? Well, I'll tell you what. Maybe stop building those planes 
find a better way to peace. You don't need that plane. You don't need the plane. You don't need the plane. Okay, you don't need that gas. Okay? But if I can perpetuate the need, I can then suffer, what do they call those now? Oh, acceptable losses. Love that term. Well, that's an acceptable loss. What, how many is that? Today it's a million. Right? Last week it was 500,000. But let's see, how many more planes we've got to fly? Nah. Acceptable losses, um, let's make it 1.2 million. That's the entire population of Oahu. When that line keeps changing because somebody else is your trouble. I don't know that diplomacy can help that. Right? There's a fundamental flaw in, in the relationship of people. So when the military is prepared to harm their own people, what does everyone else outside the gate think? You're poisoning your own people. That's not going to stop you from poisoning me. And heck, you may have been poisoning me all along, and I had no idea. It just got to the concentrations now that you can actually see it. So I've been drinking fuel in my water for how long now? Right? So I'm saying these are the kinds of questions. If, if I don't do this at this level, you can get really angry at the other level. Right? So you have to get past that and say, okay, so what's the right, how do we get this done? But you've got to hold people accountable. See this, see this, see this? Here's the evidence. Now you're just ignoring the evidence. Now that's just one water issue. We have another water issue where waters that would feed the land, feed the farmers, everything, literally, here's the water, stop, dry for the rest of it. The water has never got to the, to the ocean for decades because the sugar plantations were taking the water by lease rights, right? Taking it. And then a law came and said, no, you have to let the water go. Well, you know, we have this, we have to fix the drain. It's like drag, drag, drag. And they say, okay, they let the water go. Everybody says, yay, next week later, boom. Oh, hello, there's a law. Well, we got this new project. Ownership. Our biggest problem in Hawaii is that we're dealing with a completely shift in the relationship. For us, it was stewardship. It was kinship. What we owned was the stewardship responsibility. Today, it's about ownership and the responsibility of stewardship, right? That's a different thing. They own it. And with the bundle of rights of ownership comes the bundle that says, I have the right to destroy it. Water being. One thing. I can use what I want with it. It doesn't matter what you're going to do. And like I said, it has nothing to do with Hawaii. That happened in the West. It happened in all parts of the world where people can say, if I can control the water, I can control the community. Human condition? Maybe. Right? But that is one of the conditions. And I'd like to offer that if we look hard enough, the placement of U U.S. military bases around the world, it's not oil. It's water. We are located and placed in every place in the world where there is an abundant source, or was an abundant source of water. It's not oil. That's what you want us to think. But if you look carefully and closely enough, we are located in places where there's sources of water. Why? Because that's, that's what we're going to be fighting over. Yeah. Remember the movie Dune? We're done. Sorry again, long answer to your question. But I hope that it kind of got to it. We've got to move the mana to this side of the room. It's kind of quiet on this side. <laughs> I feel like the boat's going to tip over on this side. Hi, I'm, I'm Kiana. Hey, Kiana. Um, nice to meet you. Um, this may be a, a narrow question, but so I'm Tongan, um, mm -hmm. and so you know, in culture, and at least in Tongan culture, and I'm sure in other Polynesian culture, it's a big thing to share everything. You share mm -hmm. your culture, you share your knowledge, you share your food, you share your land, you share everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think today there's a lot of kind of contention with, you know, with indigenous populations sharing what they know um, out of fear of, you know, historically being taken advantage of sharing that. Mm -hmm. And... I, I, I'm wondering like how you have been able to kind of reconcile maintaining your identity and your your family and mm -hmm. um, 
and you know being Polynesian and being Hawaiian like but also being able to share that and mm -hmm. to share you know it's it's like the center of Tongan culture you share everything and mm -hmm. so I, I'm just wondering like how you've been able to reconcile that and especially in an academic space be able to share what you know and what's from your community without mm -hmm. um, letting in more damage and harm right yeah, thank you for that question. I think it's a very appropriate one because uh, the Native community that I'm working with right now are having that very problem. Their concern is that if they expose and share with the scientific community their knowledge of where the animals are, why they're there, where the plants are, that that too will be extracted. And so there is a, a real guard on that. And so it comes down to their agreements. Unfortunately, the agreements that Native communities have had from agencies uh, that currently run things have not been consistent. If anything, they've been consistently working against those communities. So we have to find a new way of ensuring whatever that is. In other words, you give me your firstborn child before you do this. Right? They have no skin in the game. There's no relationship. It's like, oh, and here's the meme, right? Person walks up, oh, you have so much to offer. Native person, over their head, what does he want? Right? And I said, translation, what can I take from you? Again, tongue, firmly in cheek, but that's their experience. Right? The veiled notion, oh, you have so much to offer. Imagine what we can help the world with. Right? I'll give you 80 cents a pound while I sell it for $1,000 a pound. I'll give you the 80 cents equity in some cases and it's not even about the money it's the intention so that's the condition what's the aspiration well maybe we share this thing right? how do we get this together but more importantly why should we give this to you you keep you keep taking it not only that you damage it and so while sharing is a are part of it. There's also the thing, who do you share it with? And under what conditions? Yeah, I'll share everything under these conditions. So now we have to be con con conditional. Whereas previously it wasn't conditional because we were all living presumably under the same set of values. Right? But the values have changed. The fact that anything that you don't have to pay for is considered free, that there are no costs, it's a fallacy. Most of the stuff that we're working on today all of these talks that we're having right now, fallacies, fantasies, right? But we've given them life, and now that we've, now that we've lived this fantasy has become a reality for us, some of us are f having a hard time going back. Where did this fantasy begin? How do we unravel all that? And for Native people, our legends and our stories are rooted in fact. At some point in time, when it becomes a myth, then you have to ask a question. These things aren't myths. We can point to it. Right? So sometimes we have to change the myth. Right? What's the real story behind there? What's the real narrative? And who's telling the story? You know? It's probably one of the more difficult things to, to navigate. But that's where discernment comes in. That doesn't become prejudicial. Right? And that's the hard part. So the level of discernment that we're using, uh, that's spoiled, that's good, that's growing. That's discernment versus anything red, I don't like. Everything blue, I don't like. It are all bad. You know those guys, they're all like that. Right? That's when you become discriminatory. Your discernment becomes discriminatory. So we have to be careful that we don't become discriminatory and prejudicial in our levels of discernment of who we work with, how we invite them into our circles. And I think that's what the community is trying to find right now, that balance. And it starts with our communities. What's good for our communities? Right now, some of this is, before we feed the world, can we feed ourselves first? You know, it's okay on the airplane. Put your mask on first before you put it on the person next to you. It's okay for them, so why can't I feed myself first before I feed everybody else? Yeah. And we've had communities give up their entire island groups, the Marshallese, the Micronesians, tell you what, can you give us your islands so that we can
test these bombs, you'll be saving the world. And you know what these people said? Really? We'll be, we'll be helping to save the world? Yep. You just need us to let us test this thing. Okay. We'll take care of you. Were they taken care of? Nope. Right? Their entire island system blown up. Their water is poisoned for life. And you have children who are walking around. And then they became the guinea pigs. And they said, we're going to give you a trip to America. Come on a plane. And when you get there, we get to poke you. You get to put this gown on. Go stand in this room. And all because they were going to save the world. I'll tell you what. That narrative has not changed. Right? But you have so much to offer. Imagine what the world can do to learn from your off-grid technology of how to use the sun or how to use this medicine. You know, you could change. You could save the world. But we're going to patent everything you give us. We're going to make it ours. And you have nothing to say about it because you're saving the world. While we make millions and millions of you die. Seems like an even trade. Yeah. I hope you're not hearing any anger in my response. But how ridiculous that is. Right? It just seems very... Really? Are we having a conversation about the same people, the same people that share this place to someone said family? It's a very dysfunctional family. Right? But that's because we don't know one another. We need to know one another again. When I see you, I need to know you. I breathe the air. I ate food. I drank water. Your daughter slept in my house with my son. My son and his friend is off. Because now... I'm not going to hurt you because I know your father. I know your mother. Your mother knows my... But it's so easy to go, I don't know who you are. We have an ideological issue. Well, tell that to my kids. Okay. Sorry, you got me riffing now, Mike. Well, I'm glad because I hear truth in your voice. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so rich. So many things. So uh, kind of going on what we've been talking about, you know, this, you have so much to offer. And mm -hmm. I, I've been wrestling with a lot of those feelings in regards to knowledge. Mm -hmm. As we have kind of perceived and defined it within institutes like this. And how, in a way, I, it's hard to kind of reconcile the exploitativeness of our mm -hmm. current higher education systems of knowledge right. and how we perceive and, you know, we need to preserve these ancient ways, so I need to do some study, or I need to go here mm -hmm. and e extract, mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't go back to the, the communities. Right. Um, how do you, you know, what are your thoughts on that, and like, you know, how education today is also very much part of that kind of uh, modality of, of seeing, mm -hmm. you know, the knowledge. I, I think it's a great question. I think all of us need to ask that of ourselves, right? is how do I leave a person, how do I leave a community, how do I leave a place better than when I found it? Simple, right? If you share with this with me, how have you been better because you shared this with me? Simply because I haven't paid for it, but there's still a cost, right? And if we believe that there's balance in the universe, then how do I balance it out? I don't have to pay you anything, but I'm gonna build you a new house. Right? Those are still resources. It's, what's, the, what's the exchange rate? That's the problem. We haven't established a shared currency. Right? And if that currency is not aloha, then I don't know what it is. Right? What many of us don't have forgotten, at least the elders that taught me and, and revealed to me, is that there was a time when we call it bartering, trading, that wasn't the case in our community, right? So he's the farmer that provides taro. You provide fish, you provide salt, you provide hale, houses, right? And so at some point in time, the farmer knows that the fisherman needs food. You got five people in your family. You come home and you find five, five taro sitting on your, on your desk, right? It's not because you went over and said, oh, do you want five fish for your five taro? His job was to make sure you had taro. You had taro, you had taro, everyone. And he knew everybody in the family. He's got five, you got three, you got two, you got one. 
That was equity, not equal, right? And so while he was out delivering taro, you were out delivering fish because he has fit three in his family. You made sure you got six fish because he didn't need to get tubble, blah, blah, blah. And everyone here got their fish. And not because you got taro, and not because she was building your house. She was building your house because you could put taro and fish on her table. She didn't have to go fish. She didn't have to go plant taro. Why? Because you had her back. It was a community that had one another's back. And when someone's got my back, guess what? I can look forward. Right? Imagine, I can actually focus on my skill. I can focus on my responsibility. I can feed everyone else and do what I was put here to do. That's community. We don't operate that way anymore. In fact, it was defined, it was told, well, they had a bartering system. He gave them three taro, he gave them four fish. And at some point in time, well, I can only give you three today. That's the U.S., the, the Western trading process. That wasn't the way it was. If you're going to live in this community, then you've got to participate in the community. And for there to be harmony, everybody participated because I was born into the family of fishermen. And what do we do? We fish. For what purpose? Feeding others. So my commitment to you as a family member in this community was whatever it is I did, I will do it for you. Because if I don't, I hurt myself. That's a very different measure of worth. Right? And more importantly, because I know the fisherman. I know the taro man. I come home, hey, Uncle Mike was here. There's the taro. Right on. Uncle Mike, mahalo. Acknowledgement. Today, I don't know where this is coming from. In fact, you're not going to find extras on your doorstep because it went to Craigslist. Oh, I got some extra. I wonder how much you can make for this. Right? It's not, like I said, the focus has become shares, how many, versus sharing, how well. And I think that's an opportunity. Not to go back. I don't, I'll be the first to say, I don't think we can go back anywhere. I think we can certainly pull forward all of those things that really created the human condition that we can be proud of and that our descendants can be proud of and that gods can say, Phew, finally, finally they got it. Yeah. Presuming they're watching or they care. Just the meandering of my mind for today. One, One more. All right, last. <laughs> I'm sorry, we're at the bottom of the honor people's time. I don't like to stand between people and their food. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to uh, ask a little bit more about the metrics of success, mm -hmm. um, shares versus sharing. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the metrics of success in the current capitalistic system mm -hmm. are so institutionalized mm -hmm. and so deeply ingrained in the system that it seems like changing the metrics is impossible without the whole system breaking down. Mm -hmm. And so how do you see the metrics of success in the current system transforming into one that is sustainable for the future? That's a real good question, and we're actually working on it, at least in our, our communities, right? I, I think it's acknowledging that we're not trying to change the entire system. Why? Because the system itself is collapsing. It's falling apart. And I don't want to uphold something that's falling apart. I'm not saying it. They're saying it. Right? It's collapsing. Stuff is happening. So if that's the case, we start creating the new condition. Right? You and I don't have to exchange dollars. We can handshake because I trust you. You trust me? Good. Because that's all you got with the dollar bill anyway. It's just trust. That's all that's worth anymore. So if we're operating on trust on that side, why can't we operate on trust on this side? You make sense? Because if you pull that little note out, it says, in God we trust, but in actuality, you're saying we entrust with somebody else will print more money. But if you take that to the bank today, I want everything right now, all of it. I like it in gold. Or I like it in silver. Good luck. But if you come to my house and say, Ramsey, you said you're going to help me. What time? When do I need, when do I need to be there? You can trust that. 
But that only happens in community. It only happens in family. And I like to think we've operated, but we're, we're not that community. We are a community of transactions. You know, all these friends that we have on Facebook, they're not really friends. Right? And it's not that they're bad people. It's just that this is more important than this. Why aren't there hearts there instead of thumbs? Yeah. I don't know. I, d I don't know that we want to change the whole system. Um, it's easier to create a space for people to move to than it's to pull people out of the ones they're stuck in. There needs to be motivation, internal motivation. You were in Kukui Nut. There's one called Macadamia Nut. You guys Macadamia Nuts fans? You know how hard it is to break open a macadamia nut without damaging the nut inside? Use a hammer, it's all gone. Well, one of the ways to get a nut to crack is increase the heat. Internal pressure cracks the shell. External pressure damages the nut. I think if we increase the internal pressure on our communities to begin to shift and change, growth happens. But instead, we use a system of external pressure called taxes, called punishments. And we add more pressure, and guess what? We just get harder. We harden or completely retreat. Right? At some point in time, the internal pressure of wanting to grow, wanting to be better, wanting to be right, its being rather than just becoming. But it's also about belonging, not belongings. We have focused on your identity based on belongings. Even if it's a degree, even if it's a car, whatever it is, now that I have this, I'm part of the membership. I've got membership now. It may be a false membership, but it's membership. But if you're part of a family, part of a community that knows you, you know them, that's a sense of belonging that many people are striving for by securing a set of belongings that give you a false sense of belonging. Right? So it may not be the value of the dollar, but the value of self. Am I worthy? Are you worthy? Is this a valuable relationship? Can I value you as much as I value me? Can I value my children as much as I value your children? The value of values. There's something to be said about that. But if we continue to look at it from a measurement or metric of how much we have, we have a lot. There is a great abundance. But we look at the world of abundance through the lens of scarcity. It's an odd thing. We really should be thinking more abundantly because look at how much we're losing. <laughs> it's like, what? We lead with scarcity and we end up with but. Just start with abundance. We have more than we need. Oh, but, but I want so much more. That's a human condition. That's not a systems condition. That's a human condition, which we then set up a system to satisfy. So yes, it is ingrained in the system. But who created that system? Who's playing in the system? If you stop using the ATM, they'll close it. Seriously, I've seen it happen. Right. The ATM itself only feeds the demand, but if you stop using it, they'll close it. It's not cost effective to have this machine there anymore. We see it happen all the time. So what it comes down to is choices. Or you telling them you don't want it anymore, right? Because this is, but part of it is and I, I hope to don't oversimplify this, but conditioned responses versus informed choices. Okay? If I walked, and I did, by the way, walked into the store, and I said, so where are your jackets? Where are your coats? I like this. Well, we don't make that anymore. What do you mean you don't make that anymore? Well, that's not the style. This is the style. You mean I can't choose? No, you have to choose from this. I, have, I don't have a choice. Who made the choice for me? The marketing guys. The designers, well, I think design, they should be like this now, and the pants should look like clown pants or whatever. That's what you get to choose from. So I walk into the store now, I think I'm going to make a choice of the garment I'm going to wear, but even that stuff that's in the store 
was put there by somebody else. They're saying, this is what the market, this is the season for it. I can't go in and buy a kaftan because I want to feel comfortable. I have to buy what's on the... So did I really make an informed choice? Somebody else made the choice for me. So I'd, I'd ask ourselves and ask my students, why did you wear what you're wearing today? Well, I, I, it was in my closet. Well, who put it in the closet? Well, my mother gave it to me. So did you choose it or what? It's what you had available. At some point in time, when do we make an informed choice? And they say, well, these choices really aren't conducive to my belief system. These choices will lead to these things. These choices, because that's all you gave me, I don't think I want to choose from that bucket anymore. Well, there are no other choices. Well, I guess we've got to create new ones. That's the creative condition that we as humans have. But we can be lazy about it and stay where we are. Right? Well, because it's easier. I don't have to make the choice. We're here today because somebody did make a choice. They didn't want to play the game anymore. Many, 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 many generations ago. I'm not saying it's easy by any stretch of the imagination. But I think we can make different choices. We just have to be committed. Committed to a new condition. Or I want to say a new condition, maybe a preferred condition. That used to be, that could be again. And if it was never, ever before, then let's make it happen. Think about the paradigms and the paradigmic shifts that we've gone through. We could never break the four-minute mile. And a guy named Waddle does it, and everybody starts to do it. Belief system. If we believe it to be that way, so be it. But once we begin to shift the belief system and develop the faith and capacity because we did it, we can repeat it, the science, it's repeatable, it's duplicatable, it's replicatable, ah, we have something. Yeah. But I think we need to put some guardrails on it. We need to put some parameters on it that whatever we do will not damage that. Whatever we do to get this won't hurt him. Because if we don't do that, then the acceptable losses come in again. Well, I mean, it's just a few people. It's just a few animals. It's just a few bears. It's just a few. It's just a few. And it becomes a few million. Yeah. Yes, the system is rigged. The system is what it is. But if you don't want to play in the system, you have to find a, a better way. And right now, there are millions of people lining up trying to get out of a system. And the system won't let them out. Right? We're seeing that happen. This isn't conjecture. It's happening right around us. So we have to ask ourselves the deeper question, what is going on with the human condition? Not only did we allow ourselves to get there, but we're allowing individuals who don't subscribe to those same you know, values and practices to let millions of people who want to leave their country not leave. Don't know what the reason is, but I think I do. Those people are actually doing what I'm trying to do. They're trying to leave the system. The system won't let them. For any thought. And so to my Kanaka Maoli brothers and sisters who might be listening or see whatever this, if this should ever come out, you know, we have that scenario in Hawaii right now. We're going to have to do something and change things, but it's easier to stay where we are than to move to a place that we don't know. You know, the devils I know are better than the angels I don't. I can deal with this. But that, that, that's, that's too far out. I, I can't see that. And so why, somehow we have to show them slowly but surely that there is a way that we can do that but we have to be honest we have to be truthful with ourselves as well as, as well as others what it is and in the Pacific Islands right now and I'll come back to where we started we've had people who are trying to say we need to better our condition our last keeper wasn't keeping us and wasn't paying attention to us so let's go to the next keeper the Pacific started turning east to China. And China said, hey, we'll help you. Yeah. What do you need? And then the last keeper on that say, whoa, 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 wait a minute, where are you guys going? Right? Uh oh, we've been neglecting them. We better do something. Quick. Hey, here's eight hundred million dollars. Would that do it? Eight hundred million dollars? That's doggone insulting. 
right? If you can throw up $800 million with $31 trillion debt, something's going on, right? $800 million into the Pacific. And I goes, okay, thank you. We won't go to Uncle China's house today. But maybe tomorrow. But see, the system is built that if I can get you to stop, just hold on a little bit. And what I've tried to share with my Pacific Island friends is that if they're going to give you $800 million, there's probably several trillion they're pulling out of this ocean to give you that $800 million. That's already yours. So why are you giving that up? If they're willing to come that far, <laughs> the negotiation table has changed. It's changed overnight. And you don't even know it yet. How do you then say, tell you what, if, if that's that important to you, let's really have a conversation. What, what's, what is this really worth to you? Because those guys are willing to pay something else. Right? But see, we haven't learned that. We haven't become, because that means adopting practices and value sets. That's not a custom to us. That's like, I've got to hold your neck. I've got to hold you to the ground. That's not who we are. That's our challenge. That's the hard part. Right? I don't want to be you to beat you. I don't want to beat you. I just want to live. And hopefully together. See, that's where the metrics become very difficult. Different game. And this is all philosophical, of course, but I'm living that experience daily when we have to talk to people. Says, why? What are we going to do? What's the next step? How do we get to this next point? Knowing that at any time you could be so disrupted that someone could say, oh, we've got to put a stop to that. Yeah. Maybe we shouldn't air this. Pardon me? Yeah, and many others. People we haven't even heard of. Because speaking truth to power is a dangerous thing. Right? So it's one thing to be disruptive. It's another thing to be a hacker. Right? When you can hack the system long enough so that all of a sudden it becomes a new system. And so many people are doing it, social hackers. Not the computers, but the way we do our systems. Simply by shifting language, shifting concept, changing the lenses. And I think the native lens is a way of shifting things because people want it. They're already doing it. They sense something in that native knowledge. They sense something in the way of the indigenous because that's who they are. They just lost it. They don't realize it, but something's been triggered in them, and they're now coming to those who keep that knowledge who still have a memory. And so those who remember are the keepers now of that. But those who are waking up, the woke, Unfortunately, they're not prepared to just receive. They have to own it, too. That's what's frightening. It's not enough that I can learn from you. It's not enough that I can become healthy from your medicines. But now I have to patent it. And I'm going to take control of it. And then I'm going to do something else with it. That's a huge leap from, can you help me? <laughs> right? Help you what? And unfortunately, that's the world that's reflecting back to me. I'm out there. So I have to ask myself, what is it about me that's allowing me to see this? What, where have I come in my own journey that has now put me in the place that I'm looking at all of these things and I'm getting to reflect back on it or to reflect on it? So what is that reflection in me? And so something in me, I've got to begin to adjust and shift. Hope on the portal. It always comes back to me. It comes back to each of us. Yeah. And if we can make that personal shift, that instead of buying something that's going to kill, destroy, pollute, it's a conscious choice. It may be uncomfortable, but the convenience of living the way we do is creating the inconvenience of how we do it. <laughs> Think about that. Because I want to drive somewhere, I pull oil out of the ground. Let me close with this, Michael. What I try to do at night, or as often as possible, is answer a letter to my descendants. One not written yet. But if I were to answer a letter from the seventh generation, 
as the fourth. It may be the 14th generation. And the question is, what were you thinking? <laughs> right? Even the greatest contemplation of sitting there, you know, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this. That is in the current time. We have no idea what's to come. All we can do is our best. Because the best that my ancestors did, we are in the process of trying to change. Right? We are living a better life according to our standards and perhaps theirs. We want better for you. And here we are saying, we need better. We need to change. So how do I begin to say, we need to do this so that they can have better when I'm doing exactly what my ancestors did? So that's the cautionary note. So I need to ask them. I need to go forward and say, what is it? And I'd like to offer this question to you. If we were to go four generations forward, what would the book of absurdities look like? Right? Let's write the book of absurdities together. For instance, in the future, they're going to look back at us and say, how absurd was that? They actually had a vehicle that was basically a battery that they replaced from taking something else out of the ground, and they still took it out of the ground, saying that that was better than taking the other stuff out of the ground. But this is even more toxic than the other stuff because when it was done, they had no place to put it. And then they put it in the ground, and it poisoned everything else. How absurd was that? Ah, good idea, electric vehicle, but they didn't need to do that. While we're sitting in the back, get an electric vehicle, the newest thing, the best thing ever, better than sliced bread. How absurd was it that they actually got on this rocket and blew themselves up to space, right? When everything that they're looking for up there was already here. They spent billions of dollars Sending themselves up there when if they stopped spending billions of dollars on the other stuff, they wouldn't have had to go anywhere. How absurd was that? Right? Let's not just assume that what we're doing right now is the best thing. Let's look for the absurdity in what we seem to be. That's the answer. Why? Because we've already done that to what our ancestors have done. How absurd of that. And the absurdity of some crazy Hawaiian coming to Brown University. I would never have thought this would happen 20 years ago. How absurd is that? Thank you for welcoming me and giving me an opportunity to be on my soapbox for the last hour or so. I hope it was informative. And if anything, if you didn't like it, my name's Michael. <laughs> oh. Thank you.